Good morning. Welcome to Central Evangelical Church on this fine Sunday morning. Uh, you join us as we are continuing our series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we're really pleased that our pastor, Bert, is with us today to give us his um, message from Matthew chapter 7, which is all about asking, seeking after God. And one of the things that struck me over the past few weeks is, is this idea has come back again and again, the idea that as, heavy, as, sorry, as earthly parents, we look after our children. How much more is God looking after us? How much more does he want to give us what we desire if we seek to follow him, if we seek to put him first in our lives? And we've seen that the standard that Jesus sets is high, but it's what he expects us to aim towards. And so we're looking forward to what Bert has to say. And also we've got Christine coming to give us a children's talk later. So we look forward to listening to that as well. We're going to spend some time in worship this morning as we just come into God's presence, as we just seek his face, as we just quieten our hearts and prepare ourselves for what he has to say to us. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you that you're a good, good father. We thank you that you, you look after us. We thank you that you care for us. And Lord, in the middle of this, after these challenging times, as we look around our country, as we look around our world, we know that you are in control. And Lord, we, we trust in you because we know that you are a mighty God, that you are in control and you hold the universe in your hands. And so, Lord, we look at our small problems in the light of our universe and we just offer them to you. And we thank you that you, you give us promises. You promise to be with us. You promise to give us what our hearts desire if we seek after you with all our heart. And so this morning, as we worship you, as we quieten our hearts before you, we just pray that you would come with you, via your Holy Spirit and you would talk to us, that you would speak to us, that you would touch our hearts. And Lord, that we might be blessed from being at church this morning, even though it's a very different way of being at church. We're still together. We're still together as a, a group of your people, as a family, with you as our Father. And so we thank you and we praise you this morning. Amen. Amen. King 
of love has come. Troubled minds can know his peace, captive hearts can be released. King has come, King of love has come. you this morning because we acknowledge that you are the one who works miracles and Lord whatever is going on in our lives right now whatever challenges whatever problems we are facing we know that you are in that situation and we trust you and we release our worries our problems our anxieties 
to you because we know that you can work miracles. Amen. Hi, I'm Christine, and I'm the part-time youth worker here at Central Evangelical Church. It still feels weird to say that. My husband Gus and I have been meeting with the youth group for Bible studies online since March. We've had some great discussions as we've looked at the Sermon on the Mount, the I Am Statements of Jesus, and the Book of Philippians. The week before last was the Youth Festival Magnitude, which was held online, and we were blessed to be able to meet in person for the last session here at church. One of the seminars that was particularly powerful was from IJM, the International Justice Mission, who are working to end slavery and injustice. They set a challenge for young people to cycle to magnitude. I thought it would give a quick plug here for our own Daniel Newman, who signed up for this challenge. Over the next few weeks, he's going to be cycling 66 miles, the distance from Kilmarnock to Lendrick Muir, to raise funds for this important ministry. If you want to sponsor him, please get in touch and we can point you to his Just Giving page. Also from this week, we're beginning to meet for youth Bible study here at church and appreciate your prayers for that and for the young people and their teachers as they prepare to go back to school after five months of learning from home. In Bert's sermon today, he's going to be sharing from Matthew chapter 7. In the first five verses, Jesus talks about how it's wrong to judge people. This is what it says. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. What is a plank, you might ask? A plank is another wood, word for a log or a bit of wood. You might have heard pirates say someone is to walk the plank, which was a long bit of wood that looked a bit like a diving board off the side of the boat. How easy would it be to see if you had a big chunk of wood or a plank sticking out of your eye? It would definitely be hard to see something tiny like a speck of dust in someone else's eye if you had a huge log sticking out of yours, wouldn't it? But what does Jesus mean when he says this? Obviously, we don't walk around with actual logs sticking out of our eyes, but there are sometimes things we might have in our lives that can stop us from seeing properly and stop us helping others. Jesus wants us to first deal with those things so that we can see and love others properly. There's a picture under here, but I can't see it because all of these planks are in the way. Let's have a look at them and see if we can get rid of some of them, will we? Unforgiveness. We always need to be ready to forgive when people make mistakes or hurt us. People are sometimes careless, absent-minded, tired, or might be going through a rough time, and they can make mistakes to criticize people or hold it against them because they've made a mistake as having a plank of unforgiveness in your eye. Jealousy. Jealousy means to want something that others have. If you're jealous of people who have something you want, who are smarter than you or more talented than you, then you have a plank in your eye. Selfishness. If you always want your own way, if you keep the best things all to yourself, or if you put someone down so that you look better, you're being selfish and you have a plank in your eye. Arrogance. If you look down your nose at someone because you think you're better than them, you have a plank in your eye. Prejudice. Having an opinion of someone without knowing them is being prejudiced. If you judge someone by the clothes they wear, how they speak, what they believe, their age, or by the color of their skin, you've got a plank in your eye. Now, there. We can see the picture clearly. And look, there's someone here who needs help. And because we've removed all those planks, we're able to see and help this person. So with God's help, we can do what Jesus says and remove any of these planks. And by doing that, we can see others and love them properly. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the words of Jesus that we read in Matthew. Help us to remove any planks that are in the way of us being able to see and help others. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to, to be with you again. Obviously, you'll be able to tell by now that uh, I'm not at home anymore. I'm down at the church. Um, and so we're able to now uh, record the service uh, and send it out from, from the church. Um, so although you still can't be here, um, hopefully it'll, it'll give you a, a little uh, sense of, of being together, uh, coming from a, a familiar familiar place. Uh, 
just a word on next, next weekend. Next weekend we've got John Burns. Uh, he's going to be preaching and finishing off the series on the Sermon on the Mount. And so he'll be looking at John, uh, Matthew, sorry, chapter 7, uh, verses 13 through to, to 29. Um, but this morning we're going to look at uh, Matthew 7, verses 1 to, to 12. Um, so let me just read that just now. Uh, this is Matthew 7, 1 to 12. And it says this. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Let's just pray just now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your for your word. Thank you that it's living and active. Um, Lord, thank you for the power contained in your word. And we thank you for these verses that we've read, um, uh, very challenging um, for us in, in, our, in our church, in our, in our culture, um, in our context. And I pray, Lord, that we will um, leave uh, at the end of this service uh, with a renewed sense of, of, your, of your love for us, um, but also to, to be challenged um, with some of the things that we, we might need to address in our own lives um, that we read about in this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are, there are phrases that are used um, in, in everyday life that, that come straight out of the Sermon on the Mount, and people use them all the time and, and no, have no idea um, that that's where they originated. Um, so things like being the salt of the earth, Sermon on the Mount, going the extra mile, Sermon on the Mount, blowing your own trumpet or not blowing your own trumpet, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and the rest of the Bible, the, there are many more, here are a few. Uh, the blind leading the blind comes from Matthew. To fall by the wayside comes from the Gospel of Luke. By the skin of your teeth or you know, escaping by the skin of your teeth or passing an exam by the skin of your teeth comes from the book of, of Job. So people use these all the time and, and they have no idea. Another really popular one is one that we've just read in verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Although people don't really say it like that. Normally they say, judge not lest ye be judged, which basically means um, treat others the way you would want to, to be treated. Um, but what's ironic about this phrase is it's often used by non-Christians, a lot of the time by non-Christians, to accuse uh, Christians. And it usually comes right after a Christian has maybe expressed a particular Christian belief or an ethic which is, which is in conflict as to to how that person's actually living. Um, so, so here's a, an example, just a very simple one. Uh, years ago, I worked in a project in Glasgow and there was a, a, a woman worked in the office called Nancy who was a Christian and we used to have coffee uh, together with the, the rest of the staff and they, they knew I was a Christian as well. But, and it was, it, it was a rougher part of, of Glasgow and the, the, the language was very choice during the coffee time. And every time somebody swore, Nancy would tut. So, and, and all the people could say was, well, she's so judgmental. She's so judgmental. Don't judge. And then all of a sudden they become interested in what the Bible says. Bible says, doesn't the Bible say there's something about not judging people? But, but there's confusion over this phrase, particularly in, in, this, in this chapter. First of all, Jesus is addressing Christians um, here. Um, and, and secondly, looking at it, most people assume that what this means um, don't judge or you too will be judged. Most people assume that it means you can't say anything negative about anyone. You, c you can't have any opinion on the way a person lives their life because what well, it says right here, do not judge or you too will be judged. 
So if, if a Christian brother or sister is, is, is blatantly living in sin and you call them on it, you, you point that out to them, they, they will maybe come back to you with, well, you, you, you can't judge me. The Bible says you, you, you can't judge me. Or, or a lot of the time you, react, you, you might think before you even get to that point, um, well, why would I do that? Because I've got stuff going on in my, my own life. Why, who am I to, to correct them? But when Jesus says this in verse 1, he, he doesn't mean what our, our culture means. This command doesn't mean that we're to, to, never, to never offer a, a, a correction based on, on God's word. And that's, that's the important thing. When we correct people, um, Christian brothers and sisters, and, uh, we're, we're doing it based on God's word. We're not doing it based on, on how we think they should be living uh, their lives or, or the moral code that we have, but based on, on God's word. And we know this. We know this is true because of the words and actions that Jesus uses all the way through the Sermon on the Mount because he, he makes one judgment after another, one ethical correction after the other. And so if you were to take out all of the verses uh, in chapters 5, 6, and 7 where Jesus essentially says, don't do it this way, do it this way, you would have hardly anything left. In chapter 7, uh, Jesus isn't teaching us that we, that we shouldn't judge at all, um, but that we should make true, wise, and more importantly, loving judgments uh, on our brothers uh, and, and sisters. Now, there's, there's so much going on in this passage. There are 12 verses, and in those 12 verses, Jesus teaches on judgment. He teaches on prayer. He tells a short parable. He ends with this uh, verse 12, which is kind of like a golden rule, verse 12. So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. And by that, he sums up the law and the prophets. So there's a lot going on. And how does it all fit together? How does this all tie together? Well, uh, John Stott uh, is very helpful here uh, in what he calls uh, the connecting thread. Uh, so this is a connection between all of the relationships that Jesus is dealing with here, because that, that's what he is dealing with in chapter 7. Uh, it's to do with relationships, how we relate to each other. Uh, how we relate to, to, to non-Christians, to unbelievers. Um, so this, this thread that goes through it, so there's a connection between the, the relationship we have and the one that we have with our Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, there's the connection between the relationship uh, of ourselves and unbelievers, a relationship between ourselves and God, and then finally a relationship just with everyone in, in general and how we're to, to treat people in light of this whole, whole passage. Uh, and, and seeing that thread... Uh, helps us to understand this. So, so we'll go through each of these. Uh, there are four. So a relationship with our brothers and sisters from verses 1 to 5, a relationship with unbelievers, verse 6, a relationship with God, 7 to 11, and then finally our general relationship, how we are to treat everyone, basically, if, if, we, are, if we are Christians. So the first one, a uh, relationship with our brothers, verses 1 to 5, and Jesus makes this serious point, but he uses a, a really humorous illustration I'm sure Gus has a, has a, has a cartoon on, on this somewhere. If you have a speck in your eye, um, if you had something in your eye, the one person you don't want to help you is the one who has got a plank in, in, in their eye. Now, the point Jesus is making here is, is not, not being a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. Now, hypocrites, if you remember uh, from Brian a couple of weeks ago, hypocrites come from the Greek word, which means um, actor. Um, so you're pretending to be something um, you're not. Um, but we have to remember that this teaching is, is for Christians. Uh, it's not about how we treat unbelievers in these first five verses, because that comes in, in, verse, in verse six. But it's for Christians, and we know that because the term brother is used. Um, and also importantly, at the beginning of chapter five, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus sits down to address his disciples, to teach his disciples. So always remember this teaching is, is for, for Christians um, predominantly. Now, Jesus teaches this because he doesn't want believers to go around, uh, around with, with specks in, in, in their eyes, um, which, which are, are sins. Uh, that's what he's talking about. Um, a, a sin or a speck left um, unattended could create a, a huge problem. So if you imagine that, if you actually imagine you did have something in your eye that was bothering you, and if you left it, possibly your eye would become uh, infected. It would become a, a huge issue. It starts off something small, becomes a huge issue, and, and, and that's basically in a nutshell how Jesus is talking about sin. Uh, it can start off something small. If it's left unchecked, if it's not dealt with, if it's not brought before God, it, be it can become something huge uh, in your life. Verse 3, he talks about uh, going around helping people to take out the specs, helping people to deal with their, their sin, yet at the same time, you have a glaringly obvious sin that you haven't dealt with, then that's, that's hypocrisy. And Jesus is saying we're not supposed to be like that. In verse 4, that's confirmed. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye 
when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. Well, verse 5 gives us a solution to this. Take the plank out of your own eye first, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. David needed Nathan uh, to show him his sin in 2 Samuel chapter 12. He needed Nathan to to show him the the speck in his eye. The men who were ready to stone the woman in John chapter 8, they needed Jesus to point out the, 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 um, the sin, the hypocrisy of their lives. So this passage isn't saying that we should never make loving judgments. We should, we should never help our brothers and sisters. But what we should do is start by examining our, ourselves to see if there, there's any unconfessed sin, to see if there's something going on in our own lives that we need to bring before God before we're able to help our brothers and sisters. That's what he's saying. Deal with the plank. Deal with the obvious things going on in your life. Bring them before God, and then you're able to help your brothers and sisters. And Jesus is encouraging us here to to live like this, to be able to help each other, not just turning a blind eye to what other Christians are doing, but actually helping people. I wonder if you've got that type of relationship in your life with another Christian um, friend, brother or sister, who can help you see clearly, who's able to speak into your life, who's able to to identify things that, that maybe need to be brought before God in your life. I wonder if you've got that closer relationship um, with someone. When something has been taken out of your eye, a small speck or whatever, there's always slight discomfort. Uh, There's always that sort of worry that the person's going to poke you in the eye. But it's better that than, than having a plank removed. It's better that than the painful process of having something removed further down the line. And that's the same with sin. It's better that it's dealt with when it's just small, when it's something that needs to be addressed, rather than something huge um, that, that has um, far-reaching consequences. So that's our relationship um, with our, our, our brothers and sisters. What about a relationship to unbelievers in verse 6? Now, verse 6 is a, is a strange um, verse. Uh, it's one, one verse, one parable, where Jesus is talking about um, dogs and, 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 and pigs. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What we learn here is the importance of telling the difference between um, an unbeliever and a a hostile um, unbeliever. Because the the term dog is used um, by Jesus elsewhere to to describe um, Gentiles, to describe unbelievers in in Matthew 15, in Revelation uh, chapter 22. And if you're a dog lover... Um, then the bad news is uh, that Jesus doesn't speak well of dogs in the Bible. In fact, no one speaks well of of dogs in the Bible because in those days, uh, dogs weren't like what we have now. They they weren't companions or or house pets. They they were despised creatures. They roamed the streets freely. They were were dangerous. They were scavengers. They they ate whatever scraps they could find. You could probably see dogs like that if you go around about the world. Um, You know, I remember being in Mexico a number of years ago on mission. And, uh, and, and seeing all these uh, wild dogs around the sort of dump sites in Juarez and, and just uh, ferocious, diseased, you wouldn't dare go near them. And that's what the dogs were like in Jesus' day. So he, he, he doesn't speak uh, nicely of them and, and uh, the unbelievers, the hostile unbelievers are compared to dogs um, here. So dogs are, are disgusting and pigs are, are, are pigs. Um, you know, this isn't the nice sort of pepper pig image that we have or, or the pigs at the Dean Park that have just had piglets. Uh, this, these were the epitome of, of uncleanness. They were filthy, greedy, um, ferocious at times. Um, and what Jesus is saying here is these aren't just your average uh, unbelievers. Uh, these are antagonistic uh, unbelievers, antagonistic non-Christians. And what Jesus is saying here is that we're, we're to be discerning um, so that we can judge correctly. Um, you know, we don't throw evangelism out the window and think, well, nobody deserves to hear um, the gospel, but we're discerning. The perils that Jesus talks about here, that is the gospel. It's the gospel message. He says, don't take, don't take your perils, um, verse 6, don't throw your perils uh, to pigs. Don't present it to those who are outwardly uh, antagonistic. So uh, how this would work as an example was if you're witnessing to someone, if you've ever been witnessing to someone, trying to share your faith, and they become antagonistic, they become aggressive, they become argumentative, then maybe you should end the conversation. Don't go down that path of, of arguing with them. Um, 
don't throw your pearls to, to pigs. That's what Jesus is saying here. I wonder if you've ever witnessed uh, to someone like that. Um, all the time, be, be praying, be asking for wisdom, be asking for, for, for discernment. Um, when you're sharing your faith with someone, I, I have this, you always have a sort of, I don't know, you, you get a feeling that, that someone is responsive, that they're willing to talk to you. Uh, and then there are other times there are people who, who, who it's obvious they don't want to talk to you about it. They, 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 they almost get angry um, about it. And what Jesus is saying here is move on from those, uh, those conversations. Why are they antagonistic? Because, well, like the pigs, they, they, they want slop. They don't want precious pearls or, or stones. They, they, they want slop. They want their own philosophy. They want their own way in life. Now, this is illustrated all the way through Scripture in places like Matthew 10, 14, where the disciples are told by Jesus to shake the dust off their feet if they're not welcome in a particular place. In Acts 19, 9, Paul withdraws from, from teaching in the synagogue, not because he's tired or he's lost an argument, but because they reject the gospel. And so Paul moves on. And sometimes the only thing we can do is leave people in their own, to their own ways and ultimately in the, uh, to the hands of God. And, and Jesus does that in, again in, in Luke 19. Now these verses 1 to 6, um, Legon Duncan, who is a, a, an American author, a really well-respected uh, church, church leader, uh, he describes this passage as the call for Christians to, to mutually discipline each other and the Lord, and we don't like that word discipline. I, I guess I mean, you think of children being disciplined in school or at home or whatever. But Christians don't like that word either, you know. Um, but if we have a healthy relationship, if we have a, have a healthy understanding and attitude towards God and towards our brothers and sisters, then that's not a word to be um, afraid of. The problem comes down through the ages when Christians try and discipline unlovingly, when Christians try and discipline when they've got a plank in their eye. That's when we run into to problems. But if we follow this teaching, you see the sin and you, you see the plank, you see the sin in, within yourself, you remove it, so you repent, you come before God. Then you see the sin in your brother's eye because you don't want it to become a plank, you don't want it to get any worse than it is, you help them remove that, but you do it lovingly. And if we follow that, then our, our Christian community will be far healthier and, and we'll see far less of the wounded Christians who wander around, who don't go to church anymore, a lot of the time because someone has tried to deal with them when that person has had a, a plank in their eye. They've been dealt with um, in a, a hypocritical way. So you read this passage, you start to understand there should, there should be in, the, in, in the, the body of Christ, there should be no, uh, don't judge me, you can't judge me. The Bible says you can't judge me because here Jesus assumes that we're, we're going to live this way. We're going to correct each other lovingly. Even people who have planks in their eyes, which are the bigger, more obvious sins, sins, are expected to do this work, according to this passage. Let's move on and, and uh, look at verse 7 uh, through to 11. This is our relationship with God. And this is the, the ask, seek, knock um, passage section. It's, it's always been intriguing uh, to me. It's not talking about when we come to Christ. It's not talking uh, about salvation, about asking, seeking, knocking. The picture here uh, described by Jesus, well, he's talking about prayer and, and he's addressing Christians, believers, and it's, an, it's the picture of persistence, um, you know, our attitude to, to prayer. Verse 7, knock, 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 um, until we have an answer. And, 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 and that's what Jesus is encouraging us to do here. And, and I wonder about you um, and, and myself as well, do we give up praying too easily? You know, we, we pray about things and we cry out to God for things, but are we persistent? Do we continuously ask God? Well, that's what Jesus says here, we're to call upon God. And we're to be confident that he's going to give us what? It says here, he's going to give us good things. What are we to ask for exactly? It's, it's such a vague answer, verse 11. We have good gifts, but there's no specific explanation as to what those good gifts are. So is this a blank check? Can we ask for whatever we want? Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's uh, strength and courage to share the gospel. Maybe we need deliverance from a particular sin. Maybe it's all of those things. But what's important to remember is it's, this is not a material blessing. This is a spiritual blessing that we're asking for. Because in Luke's version of this prayer, uh, these good things becomes the Holy Spirit. Now, we can't be 100% sure what Matthew's talking about here, but we can be certain that, that, that we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, we need the spiritual gifts he gives us, especially in difficult circumstances such as what we're talking about here, judging others correctly, helping each other, how we treat others, 
We need the, the Spirit. We need the Spirit's gifts of discernment. We need the Spirit's gifts of love and, and, and wisdom. And these are good gifts. And we should ask for them, persistently ask for them. So that in verse 5, Jesus tells us, so that we can see clearly. So that we can see clearly. And if we can see ourselves clearly, then we're able to see others clearly and, and, and help others and serve God in that way. So if we're going to live out what this passage teaches, we have to put what seven verses 7 to 11 says and put them into practice. And then this final verse in verse 12, um, uh, as we move on from a relationship with God and we think generally about a relationship with, with, with everyone um, in the world as believers. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. This verse begins by focusing on, on self. What would you want done to you? Well, nobody, nobody would want what happens in, in verses 3, 4, and 5. Nobody wants to be labeled a hypocrite. Nobody wants a hypocrite to, to be dealing with them. So first we ask God to see ourselves clearly, back in verse 5. Look inwardly, evaluate ourselves, ask God to show us the areas where we need to put right. And then next we can approach a, a brother and sister lovingly and help them with their speck. And always remember that, you know, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with a brother or sister, you know, how, how, would, you, how would you deal with somebody who, who had something in their eye? You would do it gently. You wouldn't just barge in. You would do it gently. And that's what Jesus is saying here. People, people have sin in their lives. People have got stuff going on. But deal with them gently. Deal with them gently. Sticking on the theme of, of judgment in verse 6, again, the, the pigs and the dogs were to discern between a, a hostile unbeliever and a, and a, and a, and a, a general unbeliever. Um, don't get into pointless arguments or don't become judgmental. Um, and then finally, thinking about all of this, all of this teaching, how do we do all this? How do we achieve all this? Because it's hard, and that, the Sermon on the Mount is hard teaching. Well, we don't do it by our own strength, but we do it by asking, by seeking, by knocking, by being persistent in our prayers before God, asking that we'll have wisdom, asking that we'll have discernment, asking that we'll have patience with our brothers and sisters and with people in general. In general. I want to finish with... Uh, one particular part of verse 11, um, which says this, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And it's that word evil there, because Jesus is he's talking to his disciples here. So these are followers of Christ. These are people who are following, trying to be Christ-like. And, he, and he, calls them, he calls them evil, and it's almost off the cuff. It's not a mistake. Um, it's a profoundly truthful statement because we might do good things and we might give good gifts to our children, but the root of all we are and all we do, we still have to contest with our, our fallen human nature, which fundamentally is, is evil. It's the evil within us that makes gossip so appealing. It's the evil within us that can't wait to point out specks in other people's eyes when we've got planks on our own. It's the evil within us that finds faults in others. And so we need a right view of ourselves. We're fallen human beings and we're in desperate need of a saviour. But thankfully there's a remedy for the evil and the remedy is Jesus. Because Jesus redeems us through, the, through his death on the cross, we're redeemed people. If it weren't for his death, we'd still be dead in our sin. But we have new life, we have a new righteousness which once was his, and now he shares it with us because of his sacrifice and because of his resurrection. And so by accepting that gift of salvation, by becoming a Christian, by coming to Christ, we can faithfully live out what it says in verse 12. And we'll do to others as we would have them do to us. We will love people. We'll have patience. We'll be loving um, brothers and sisters. And how we treat others will always be gracious, will always be understanding, and will always be kind. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this teaching and we, we submit to it and we acknowledge, Lord, that this is a, a real challenge for us, certainly for myself, this is a real challenge, Lord. It's so easy to go around and to, um, to, to, to be judgmental and to look on situations and, uh, and ignore things going on in our own lives or even be oblivious to things going on in our own lives, in our minds, in our hearts. Uh, and so, Lord, I ask... Um, for myself, Lord, that you will point things out, areas that I need to come to you um, and, uh, and ask for your forgiveness 
Um, and Lord, I pray for all of us, Lord, that, that there'll be things brought to our attention if, if that's what needs to happen, areas in our lives where uh, you want to challenge us, you want to speak into. Um, Lord, help us as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a church, as a body of believers, uh, to be loving towards one another, um, to be addressing things going on in someone's life if that's what needs to happen, um, but, but doing it lovingly uh, and doing it based on uh, how we should live in, in your word um, and not according to our, our, own, um, our own principles, but based on your word. Um, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that, um, that we are uh, redeemed um, by him, by his death on the cross. Thank you that the resurrection conquered death that we can have everlasting life, that we can have a relationship with you again, all made possible through Christ's atoning sacrifice. And we are forever, forever grateful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
you like prayer or pastoral care of some kind or practical help or just someone to talk to, then contact us at cccomarnock at gmail.com. Now, if you're a female and would prefer to talk to a female, then just mention that when you contact us and we'll arrange that for you. cccomarnock at gmail.com Thank you.